Latinx writers, you know, and women of color. And so I've been creating and curating events and workshops for a good 14 years now. And so I'm excited to be moderating this conversation. I wanted to, uh, I'd like to welcome all of the panelists. Thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome all of the guests who are here, the aspiring writers, all of the speakers. Welcome to um, the story. And we have the privilege of having um, some folks from publishing. We've ha we have Nachieli Nieto. We have Anisa Polanco and Danny Vasquez. And so what is my intention facilitating and holding um, kind of holding this kind of space is when we think about the word gatekeeper, um, it's who is the person who allows us to pass go and who allows us to collect $200, right? Very simply. And so when we think, when I think about the writers myself, you know, who is emerging, well, emerging close to 20 years emerging, um, the dream is to get this book deal, to get this six figure, seven figure advance that we know um, a lot of writers of color, Latinx writers are, are not receiving. And so the questions that, you know, we're bringing to this conversation today is what does diversity and inclusion even look like in publishing? I'll stop there. Let me introduce the panelists. Roberto Lovato, I'm not sure where to point on the screen, if you could wave, is a journalist and one of the creators of the hashtag Dignidad Literaria and co-founder co of the movement. He is a journalist and writer out of San Francisco Writers Grotto, recently completed a three-year commitment as a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley Center for Latino Policy Research. Roberto is also the recipient of a crisis reporting grant from the Pulitzer Center. His journalistic work spans the entire hemisphere and centers, centers on some of the border smashing issues of our time, immigration, the drug war, national security and climate change. His work also explores the intimate link between the online and offline worlds, between storytelling and social movements. Roberto is a frequent contributor of publications such as Nation Magazine, The Guardian, Foreign Policy, Boston Globe, um, LA Times and and invited to countless shows on on TV, MSNBC, Univision, the BBC, CNN, um, Democracy Now. He is the author of forthcom of the forthcoming memoir Unforgetting, which will be published by Harper Collins September first. Welcome, Roberto. Our next panelist is Miriam Gulba author and also co-founder of Dignidad Literaria. Miriam Gulba is a queer spoken word artist, visual artist, and writer. Um, from Miriam's stories, explores Mexican stories and traditions from a feminist lens. She's also the author of Mean, an exploration of girlhood and the violence that lurks in its midst. The book chronicles Gulba's sexual assault as well as her coming of age as a queer, mixed race Chicana growing up in Southern California. Gulba approaches these topics with ample doses of dark humor and finds herself both laughing and cringing from page to page. Gulba also penned the essay that went viral, Pendeja, You Ain't Steinbeck, My Bronca with Fake Ass Social Justice Literature which inspired the movement and it was a critical um, review of the book American Dirt. Our next panelist is David Boyles, novelist, poet, and educator. David was born to Mexican-American parents and raised in Rio Grande Valley. He earned his BA, master's, and PhD from the University of Texas. The cultural traditions of American South Southwest and Mexico inform his work across genres. He is the author of the poetry collection Shattering and Brackelage, um, published by Inkbrush Press in 2014, and the translator of Flower, Song, Dance, Aztec and Mayan Poetry, which won the 2014 Surrett Deal Frazier Award for Best Translation from the Texas Institute of Letters. 
Bowles' works of fiction and folklore include The Seed, Stories from the River's Edge, Creature Feature, 13 Frightening Folk Tales of the Rio Grande Valley, Border Lore, Folk Tales and Legends of South Texas, The Mexican Kaiju, novel Lords of the Earth, Chupacabra Vengeance, and Feathered Serpent, Dark Heart of Sky, Myths of Mexico. Bull's young adult fantasy trilogy, The Garza Twins, includes the novels The Smoking Mirror, selected as a Pura Belpre honor book by the American Library Association and A Kingdom Beneath the Waves. He currently teaches at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Is that still? That's still correct? Yes, ma'am, it is. Am I breaking up? No, I can hear you just fine. Am I breaking up? You can't hear me? I can, I can hear you just fine. Let me dial in from the phone. No, you're fine. You're no, fine. you're fine. Yes, I'm good. Let yeah. me turn on my camera. Sometimes that helps the voice. I don't know why. That's a Zoom thing. Anisa Palanco, well, welcome, welcome, um, I'm sorry, David, and welcome, Miriam. Anisa Polanco is the Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Penguin Random House. Anisa works closely with colleagues across the company to develop and advance strategic, corporate, and divisional diversity and inclusion initiatives. In addition to her husband and baby girl, her true loves include spoken word, traveling, homemade Dominican meals, and reading at all possible times. Welcome, Anissa. Natieli Nieto is the editor at large at Flatiron Books. At Flatiron, Nieto will be acquiring upmarket and literary fiction, YA and select nonfiction with a focus on work by Latinx and by POC writers. She is drawn to innovative language-driven work in fiction and idea-driven researched nonfiction on culture, feminism, immigration, and the environment. The authors she's edited and published include Carmen Maria Machado, Liliam Rivera, Yuri Herrera, Danielle Evans, Leslie Jameson, Laura Van Vandenberg, Rian Almukar Scott, Stephen Graham Jones, Helen Phillips, and Amber Sparks. Nieto was previously director of the Literary Awards Program at PEN America and the managing editor of the award-winning literary fiction annual Noon. She is on the board of Latinx in publishing. Welcome, Nachieli. Danny Vasquez is the assistant editor at Macmillan Publishers Limited. And re I was just doing some research today, Danny, that you were one of five Macmillan staffers for whom who identify as bi POC, Black, Indigenous, and people of person of color. A and one of whom is white, who drafted the initial language for an action where you all left in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I really appreciated that you, in, an, in um, a publisher's weekly uh, essay, you're quoted as saying, I'm part of the Black Diversity and Inclusion Initiative and Latinx diversity and inclusive initiative at Macmillan to keep in touch with black and POC colleagues at Macmillan personally. And there's nothing I think those initiatives can give to me or to the world that I want to see besides keeping me in touch with my colleagues. And so welcome, welcome everyone to our conversation. Can you hear me? All right, let's get into it. I'm going to I'm going to pose a question, and I guess uh, I don't know if someone is unmuting us or if we all have access. What are the stories that sell? What are the stories that sell? The stories that 
people are willing to invest David, money and speaking, I can't hear you. The stories that people are willing to invest money no, to promote. Can the rest of you hear me? Okay. We hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. So I mean I mean that to me that that's one of the, the most important things. Clearly um, stories sell that people want to read. But if people don't know about those stories, then they won't read them. And so the stories that sell that are both um, appealing to a segment of the society that wants to read them and that are promoted, that money is spent on promoting. And that's why so many of the disparities that exist in the publishing industry are there because money is invested in an inequitable way. The vast majority of it, uh, millions and millions of dollars of it when you factor in both advances and the PR money that's put behind titles, the majority of it goes to white authors. And very little of it goes to writers from communities of color or other underrepresented groups. I don't know if, if folks are hearing, I didn't hear anything. I'm gonna have to re, I'm gonna have to come back in. I have no sound. Okay, well then let's just have a conversation about it. Anybody else want to jump in, say something else? Let's let's not just leave people hanging. You can just unmute yourselves and talk. Sorry, I was frozen. Um, I think that's a, a really broad question. You know, there's and I agree with David. There's you know this idea that um, you know quote unquote cream rises to the top or whatever, or the best things will always find their audience or that good work always sells. But there is a lot of stuff that, go into, uh, that goes into making a book, say a bestseller, or making sure it gets into airports, or it's at your Hudson News in you know, the, your Amtrak train station or stuff like that. And there's a million things that happen along the way. There isn't one gate. There are, it's like an inception style series of gates that happen from like childhood on. Um, from, you know, the types of stories that your undergraduate writing teacher encourages you to write versus another one. And then your MFA person, if you, your professor, if you go to get an MFA, tells you, oh, wait, I like this, this idea for a story slightly better than this other one you're working on or whatever it is. And these sort of, these, these different ways at like various points in the process where your story gets defined by other people and whether they're willing to take a chance on it or invest in it. Um, so I don't think there's one answer to what story, what, which stories sell. I think there's many things that can make a story sell better. But you know, one of the things that is a major problem in having so few uh, Latinx acquiring editors is that there's not a lot of room for the wide experience that we have. You know, I mean, we don't, you know, a certain type of story tends to get through because that's the story that gets invested in by like 5 million little gatekeepers along the way who are each passing it on. And anytime something gets hard to place, like it's got weird language or it's got a weird format or structure, and that goes for, you know, in some ways all authors, but it's harder for authors of color, obviously in many, many, many ways, because we're so much, there's, we make up much less of the list of any, you know, publishing program. Um, but yeah, I don't know, that sort of was a rambling. Danny, do you want to take it from me now that you're in frozen? I, I think that I, I think that I approached this from a, from a really unique perspective um, here, because I'm, I'm working worker, you know, I'm one of them uh, of a very exploited class of worker. And, and, and for me, you know, I've been in this business like five years now. And I've experienced plenty other jobs before this. I, 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 and I've been, you know, endeavoring upon a bit of a labor history in America, right? And, and if, if, we, if we look at... Sorry for the te technical difficulties all. Somebody asked in the chat what we thought that sort of the million little things falling into place that it seems like it mostly uh, falls into place for white writers versus writers of color. And that's absolutely true at yeah. every step of the way, at every single step of the way. And that's, 
that's part of the problem along the whole pipeline. Yeah, and racism. you know, exactly. And you know, Najeli, you talked about the, the pipeline starting um, like with undergraduate, well, really it starts in childhood when children are being read to. Um, the books that they're read to at home, the, the books that they're read to at school, the books they're assigned, all these things begin to um, create a particular, um, a, a particular um, ear for a particular voice. And that's the thing that bit by bit, the machine tries to produce as more of that kind of voice. And anybody who doesn't, you know, fit into that is going to be kept out. You know, if you try to buck against that system, it's a, it's really hard. I mean, there are other pi there are indie pipelines and university press pipelines, but to get into traditional publishing, if you if you're not part of that that system, and it's you know it's it's a really kind of pernicious system that it has kind of systematically erased communities of color from from the U.S. national like literary canon and from entertainment in general. Um, we're not seen, we don't see ourselves, other people don't see us and our contributions. So it gets, it's, it's really, really difficult. It's much easier for the system to expend money and, and invest its resources and in promoting voices that are like those voices we've been fed all our lives than um, to invest them in something that's even slightly different, frankly. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I had to go in for my phone. Did it, is my name changed from Danny? I'm, I'm, I'm the one who broke in. Yes, you're Alicia now. I'm Alicia now. Excellent. So can we talk about the, the hashtag publishing paid me that went insane over a week ago? Can we talk a little bit about all of the writers, it was started by um, a black author. L.L. McKinney. Yeah, I'm trying to find her name. L.L. McKinney started it in, yes. in conjunction with Tochi. And yes. Tochi had uh, DM'd me and told me that um, he was thinking about uh, Janine Cummins when he initiated the, the, um, the inquiry and then LL developed the hashtag and then the, uh, they ran with it. And um, we crowdsourced quite a bit of data that the presses have been reluctant to give up. They're not um, behaving with transparency. That's one of uh, these many obstacles that Nancheli was referring to. Um, we don't necessarily have um, comparable numbers. We don't know what people are making, right? So we don't know where we stand in the hierarchy. And now that we've crowdsourced this information, it really does uh, uh, bring to light and, and into really sharp focus the disparities that exist. And it was inspired by, by the American Dirt Scandal. I mean, those disparities were, were massive, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there were folks, there were writers who were, were saying that, you know, their first book deal, they, their advance was like $7,000 or $12,000, mm -hmm. you know, certainly not, you know, six figures, seven figure. Um, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk about a little bit about the money and publishing and, and what that's about, why that is. Let's, I, let's I, well, I, 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 you go, Danny. Go ahead, no, no, you go ahead. Sorry, sorry, I had technical diff for a second. Um, so I was gonna say that, you know, publishing always likes to pretend that it's forward looking. We have a long sight line and because it takes so long to actually produce books, the act of producing books is like tedious and slow and antiquated. And it's like a cat is making paper by hand and that's why it's so slow or whatever. But it takes us like 18 months to publish a book at like, unless we're gonna crash it, unless we're an indie press, you know, or something like that. But the fact of the matter is that publishing looks backwards all the time. It's a backwards looking sort of um, process. Comping is looking backwards at something that's already been published and comparing the book that you're trying to buy to it so you can estimate how good it will do. And it's kind of all like, everybody's got a finger on the scale. It's like woogie math. 
you know, like nobody can predict how many things are going to sell or the future. And then you base an advance technically on that. And there's all sorts of things that can go into why an advance skyrockets, like perceived interest. So if you hear that somebody else at another house is bidding on it, you'll bid higher and you go to an auction and that, you know, it creates that bidding war thing. And things like interest can be just like rumors or like this really soft sort of science stuff that is not, that tends to benefit certain groups of people and not others, you know? And so if somebody knows somebody and they're whispering about a book that creates buzz around it and it gets a higher, you know, auction price or whatever. But what we've seen, I think from publishing paid me is that no matter how well authors of color are selling and no matter how many awards they're getting, that that never converts into real progress by the next book. Like, sure, you might not get a lot for your debut, but when you're winning awards, when you're Jasmine Ward and you're winning like NBAs and you know, you're having these, writing these groundbreaking books and then you're barely sort of bumping up what a sort of white author might get on their debut, that shows a huge disparity. So, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, I also, I want to say, I mean, you covered that point so beautifully. I, I also want to say we should think about somebody in the comments mentioned the, these huge advances are not that common. You look at you look at there's like a like a bell curve, right? And things are in the middle somewhere, a little lower than that. But when you look at the production of a book, the cost of making a book, right? And you look at all the sort of stakeholders in the production of a book, and you look at how much people get, how how much they get for their labor right um it's really hard to start to say how that money should be diverted when you have some of the most exploited laborers in this business you understand what i'm saying across any industry we're talking about twenty-eight thousand dollars to start in new york city twenty-eight thousand dollars for an editorial assistant and and it goes up from there there's a scale uh you know some publishers are much better than that but we're talking about exploitative wages, right? And then when we talk about what the work of an editorial assistant is, right? We're talking about the work that was done previously, like 10 years ago, by like four or five people. You know what I mean? Way more work being done over the years. Pretty much the same amount of money, people being paid for it. So when we, when we start to talk about like the problem, we know what the problem is. We, we see the Leonardo numbers. Yes, there's not enough representation. That representation does not start with what we pay authors. Like, and, and it, feels, it feels like I, I don't want that to sound combative to authors, but I do want to say like, it, it, you need to make the back, the, the back end of the website work in order for the front end of the website to be beautiful. You understand what I'm saying? And so if we're going to talk about changing what does this that industry, mean? the back end of the website being like the content management system that you use to input stuff, right? Like you, the, the company, the, the, what its makeup, has to has to has to change in order for its output to change you know what i'm saying and and so like if we're, if we're talking about better representation it, it doesn't start by saying let's get more of those million dollar deals to more of our authors no the fact of the matter is there shouldn't be any goddamn million dollar deals no that's because exactly the, right because that's the exactly industry right. doesn't know how to value the work the industry doesn't know how to value the work and and people moreover don't know how to value the work and so there's a widespread devaluation of our labor happening i'm talking about our labor as editorial assistants as assistant editors all the way up to anybody that puts their hands editorially on a book that labor devalued publicists labor devalued marketers labor devalued and so the the thing that we're producing the the work of you fine writers is being devalued off the jump so we can't even begin to talk about changing it until we start to talk about how we appropriately value the, the labor that goes into producing the, the very thing that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that is definitely true, but that all of that is also predicated on the idea that the structure itself, the system itself, the CMS, to continue with your, your metaphor, is the right one, is the right model. And I think that that's also problematic. I mean, it, it's important to value the labor, but it's also important to understand that the labor isn't representative of uh, the voices in the larger community. And just the way the Black Lives Matter um, movement has made 
this country begin to reevaluate what we mean when we say the police and what the job of the police ought to, to, to be doing is and, and, what, and whether we actually want somebody policing our communities and, and maybe what we want are different organizations that are responsive to the community's needs and beholden to the community, I think the same thing is going to have to happen to publishing. Like publishing has gotten away for more than a hundred years with a model that isn't responsive to the community and that has got to change. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point in capitalism, no businesses are responsible or responsive to the community. And we're talking about a much larger structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, and I like, mean, so I hear you. I totally hear you and agree with you on this. Yeah. But I also like, I can't burn down a building that my people are in. I and like, so. I don't think we should burn it down. You know but I, mean? I do think that so we have like, to rethink it. I just, I just want to make sure that like, everybody's out first and that you know <laughs> we're doing that can we talk about the politics and the political economy of publishing too if i may yeah. may i so yeah. That, yeah i think the economics are important obviously it's a profit making capitalist system oh, actually before anything i want to thank alicia and angie for the solidarity you gave to dignidad literaria you know, you were our peeps in New York and, and we worked together beautifully and we're really grateful for you. Um, and thank you for inviting us to this. Um, but going back to the political economy of publishing, uh, I think it's important to note, I'm the kind of guy, for example, I'll go and I'll look at who gets Pulitzer Prizes, who gets uh, MacArthur Awards, who gets, you know, and I'll ask the question, how many during the Obama era, for example, when I was going to see children caged, who, you know, children that were caged by, by Obama, children that were put in concentration camps, children whose mothers try to slit their wrists, children who try to hang themselves. I'm the kind of guy that I'll go and look at that period when that was happening and who got Pulitzer Prizes, who got MacArthur, and how many of them criticized Obama? Because Obama was and remains a clear, symbol of the liberal imaginary that prevails in US publishing. So what did I discover when I asked the question, how many of these people criticize Obama publicly? Zero. None of the major prize winners criticize Obama, not a, not a note, not even on empire, not even on bombing, not nothing. So there's a kind of an ideological filter in publishing in addition to the economics of it that, that go together because there's a gatekeeping function, right? You know, so if you're like a leftist, this far left, and, and you're of color, olvídate, no va, no va a hueler ni lleder in publishing. You're not going to... I'm out of here, Roberto, I'm out of here. Huh? So, so, but, you know, the, it, it, and if you are, you have to do what some of us do, which is spend a lot of time thinking and strategizing how you're going to navigate this very politicized ideological system that systematically excludes an entire community of people. Just look at, for example, all those, the, the, the migration crisis in the United States is primarily, you know, numerically speaking, statistically, a Central American crisis, at least the way it plays out in the news. American dirt is premised on that. So, um, but you don't see Central Americans anywhere in the story. Not a one. I, you know, I, the American Dirt took a, Mex took a Central American story and overlaid a, a, a Mexican. I mean, like I've been on La Bestia, I've been down to Mexico, I've been in Central America, not a once did I ever see a Mexican mother go to her kid, a middle-class bookseller in Mexico in Acapulco, go and tell her kid, okay, mijo, listen, we're going to go to the United States and we have a choice. We can either go on, um, we can either go on a taxi because we can afford it or we can, you know, have our family drive us in a nice car that we have or we can take an airplane and overstay our visas or we can join the Central Americans and be terrorized and risk having our limbs hacked and being robbed and being killed. I've never seen that in my entire life, but that's the premise of American dirt. So there's a, there's an ideological, I don't want to, I don't want to lose the ideological and political filtering that takes place along with the economics of it. 
Yeah, you know, and I think that's a really great point, Roberto. In our conversations with, uh, you know, different people in, in publishing, again and again, we keep encountering um, people who say to us, but, but we're, you know, politically we're the same. We, we want the same <laughs> things because there is a, a, a species of predominantly white, um, predominantly East Coast liberal rich person who thinks that because they espouse, um, you know, liberal ideals that that's good enough, that they're, they're good intentioned and they mean well, they're not trying to hurt anybody. They care, you know, they've got their, their black friends and their Latinx friends and, and, and their queer friends and, and that we should give them a pass because of that. And, and, and I, I'm just, I'm sorry to report to them that we are, that we, that we're, we don't have the same goals, that they think they're progressive, but they're actually regressive. Um, and that our agendas are not the same. And you know they think that they're going to pull the wool over our, our eyes. Que nos van a jugar el dedo en la boca, pero se equivocan. So, yes. so in February, the folks from Dignidad Literaria came to New York City, guns blazing. They they came Fine. down, no guns, blazing, just blazing them, just blazing. Candela, vinieron con con candela, con fuego and had a meeting with the folks from Flatiron Books. And there were some demands. There were some demands that were, that were put on the table and there were some commitments. One of the, one of the wins as, as Roberto, David and Miriam left that meeting and we all met outside for a conversation. There was a lot of excitement around, around being heard, around Flatiron being very open to to making the changes necessary to, to dignidad literaria, para darnos dignidad, la dignidad literaria. It's, that was, that's the whole, that was the whole intention and point. And so can we talk a little bit about what those demands are and what you can share, if anything, of where we are today, several months later? Just whatever you can share. Miriam, David? Miriam, don't you want to take this? Come on, I know you do. No? So um, the, the demands are pretty simple. We wanted them to dedicate themselves to increasing Latinx representation in their editorial staff and in the books they acquire. Um, after a two hour meeting, they said yes. And they also agreed to two other um, points, one of which was to, um, to provide us with a progress report at the end of a month. And then at the end of 90 days from that initial meeting to give us a, a final like rough draft of, of, of their plan. Like what is it that they've put into place to carry out? Um, so, you know, we did, we got the report, we got that initial uh, agreement and we went down into the streets there at, at the park and, um, and made that announcement. Then a month later, we did get that progress report. All's good. Um, included in that was the, the hiring of Najeli and, and a lot of really great stuff. Um, and then we've been waiting for the the 90 day thing. Of course, coronavirus happened. Um, a lot of other things have complicated um, issues, um, but we are expecting very soon to get a report from Don Weisberg. And then at that point, we will be able to um, to, to talk to the community and, and tell them whether, you know, hey, you know, this is something we can celebrate or hey, we need to take it to the next level. But But we are, you know, grateful that that Don has finally agreed to um, to send a report out, you know, for public view, and um, hopefully we'll have some some more news about that really soon. But you know, after some waiting, um, it, the report is around the corner. Roberto, yeah. you want to add to that? Uh, except maybe to say, well, we we're, we are uh, we were encouraged coming out of our meeting with them, and you know, got a a preliminary proposal. And we start discussing it and we just, we really just want to finalize this so we can move on. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we're, 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 we're confident we're going to get some, something from Macmillan. And we're also confident in the event that we don't get anything, we're going to have to take it back to the streets and make noise and do the things that we have to do. I mean, regardless of what Macmillan responds, 
we've got to get with the program and and advocate on our own behalf. We have to take, for example, and and, and take take uh, the leadership of the black community and in in taking matters into its own hands and leading us towards, you know, making sure that Black Lives Matter in in material, that Black Lives Matter in narrative form, right? And um, you know, by the same token, we have there's much to be learned there, and we and we have our own experiences too as, as Latinos and and as people with experience in Latin America. I mean, to the United States right now uh, is 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 it a is a profound crisis as I can remember, and uh, as as much a crisis of political imagination. And I think that uh, that's really beyond Macmillan. That's the fight within ourselves is to to expand our political imagination to really figure out how we create narratives that speak to the moment that prepare our community for the immense crisis that we're in, right? There's not literature that much that prepares us for it, quite frankly. I feel cheated by literature in the United States because it didn't prepare me for what we're facing right now. And uh, except for Miriam's work, of course, but outside of Miriam, uh, we we didn't have anything that prepared us, and uh, you know I really I really think that that that's 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 the work really beyond Macmillan is is the work of political imagination and to to kind of stir up the pot of the poet warrior within us. We really have to get I think militant about our valuing our lives. I have a question for Nachieli, Anissa, and Danny. What? What steps are being taken right now to ensure that Latinx voices are being represented right now with everything that's happened since American Dirt? Like what, what waves have we made? Where are we today? What can you share? What progress are we making? What forward movement are we making? So I can, I can jump yeah, you in. Go ahead, that's okay, I, and it's uh, for context. It's also I'm, I'm trying to find what the entry points of this conversation because my view contextually is that I sit um, within um, our HR department, but then my role um, is very much about not only strategy from an executive level, um, but also I oversee our internship program. I'm support. Uh, I mean, it's the typical role that you get of the person of color in <laughs> this position where it's a little bit of everything. Um, but touching not only talent acquisition, but also how do we help teams then think about what, how are the ways that we're marginalized people just in from a day-to-day -day perspective. So I think to the question about where we are, one of the things that I've been really, really intentional about in the time that I've been here is that really thinking about change system at, like in a systemic way, rather than just saying, we wanna hire more POC or we wanna hire um, more black and, and Latinx um, people because just like to, to Danny's point, it's one, you don't want to bring in people um, to already feel that are already marginalized to be exploited. Um, so how are you prepping teams to actually be able to bring people in to make them feel not only that their work is valuable, but that they have the same voice and decision making as everybody else on the team. Um, and that takes consistent, consistent work on let's, let's actually dismantle the way that not only our meetings are run, how are decisions made, who gets a, who gets a place at the table. Um, and that is very much layered upon layer of breaking out a system that has been happening for years and years and years. So I think for me and my work, um, it's not, I don't want to bring in people if we haven't already created a culture where they're going to be valued and that they're going to want to stay and that they know what their benefits are, they know how to advocate for themselves and that they're consistently being um, placed in, in the places that matter, not just in, you know, in the assistant positions or in places that, um, you know, you need years and years and years um, to cultivate the taste to be in, in a position of power. Um, for, again, just more concretely about what we as a company are doing, um, part of, in, and I know many, if, if you haven't, um, we did make a statement. So we actually conducted a um, a cultural assessment to, again, to this point of it's not just about diversity, but about belonging. We really wanted to get a sense of how people in the company, how their experiences of our culture were very different um, if, if you came from a marginalized background and actually get hard data. Because we know that the more that we can prove and, and get the business case, the, the more um, investment we can make um, and the more money that can be attributed to something that is kind of directly in your face. 
So one is really understanding how people were experiencing the culture and then coming out with that and really delineating, well, here's, here's our areas of, of gap when it comes to our culture and here are the ways that we need to address that gap. Um, and those things weren't surprising. Representation, obviously, we know that we need more representation in order to actually um, publish more books for the communities that we come from. But also, there are areas about our culture that we also wanted to be intentional about fixing. So the statement that came out recently um, with the, the murder of George Floyd um, and the Black Lives Matter movement now, everyone has, I think, the, the, the politics around something is like, okay, well, there's all this activity, now we need to be behind it. Um, but how can we then not just make a statement, but actually say we're making a statement, but we actually care about our Black employees, not just we're making the statement for external purposes. So the steps that were done um, in terms of that specific was really doubling down on our action plan. So, and, and I don't want to take so much space to walk through what that actual plan is, but one in, in terms of the question about representation, one is really looking at our hiring practices. So not just thinking about kind of who, who's coming into the pipeline and who's in the pipeline, but is everyone who's being interviewed actually being interviewed in an equitable way? Are you asking people the same questions? Are you actually thinking about who you're seeing? Um, are you valuing people who more who come from this Ivy League? Um, like, what are the skills that you're valuing? Um, because we know, for example, I come from a low socioeconomic, like my, my parents are, you know, they work in factories. Um, I didn't know about publishing. I didn't know that even this industry existed. So how is it that we're actually valuing the skills that people have rather than what they, you know, how they educated or what schools they go to? So it's really being very specific about how are we looking at the issues from a systems perspective? How are we then eradicating those systems and really changing those systems in order so that when people come through, we're giving them the chance that they actually deserve um, and what those are. And also coupling with actually making those connections with Latinx and publishing, for example, um, and representation matters. Um, and how are we bringing them in both at an internship level, but also when we're, when we're hiring and how do we give those people the same exact opportunities and more visibility and exposure that they weren't necessarily getting because, again, we, we believe, every, you know, we, we, we don't have any biases, we're, we're fair. And in reality, there's all these holes and gaps that we needed to um, address in the process. That's also my two-year-olds in the background, so I apologize for the crying. <laughs> but, um, and again, Alicia, if you have <laughs> She's very moved by all of this. You know, she, she really she's feels like, this. She's so. like, yes, Latinx and publishing. Yes. So, again, I'm not going to take up all the space to, to be specific about those, but I'm happy to kind of dive deeper into any of those action plans um, and talk more about that. But that's just how, again being very intentional about the approach when we're talking about representation and when we're talking about people, being very conscious that you can get people in, but that doesn't mean that they're going to have the, the say and the space and, and the power to be able to make those changes. Thank you, Anissa. Go ahead. Who's next? Yeah, no, I just want to say I really admire that position, Anissa, because like, I feel that all the time, you know, I, whether it's like mentees that I've had through like POC publishing or interns, who are, who are young um, and black or POC, um, it's, it's, it's always a really, like I'm really conflicted, you know? Like the better an intern I have, the more I wanna tell them, listen, if you can imagine yourself doing anything else, go do that. Because like it, it, it's, I mean, I came to this business at, a, at a, a later stage in my life. I was a little bit older. I honestly don't even, I, there are people, younger people in this business who I'm just like, yo, I don't even know how you, how you tolerate. You know what I mean? Like, and it, it, it's, it's the, the, the like, I'm, I, I'll always drill down the workers' rights aspect of it, but it's, it's really, I think, something that people need to bear in mind. It's like, what are we inviting young people into? What are we demanding of young people? If we're demanding change of this industry for the future, we're demanding change of young people. And so what resources, what are we doing for young people to help them enter those roles? Even if it's not within publishers, what are you doing to center the work of the people who are most exploited. And I think that's something everybody could bear to ask themselves more often. I think that's the frustration with a lot of the, that a lot of us who are queer, black, Latinx, indigenous writers who are trying to get published, this idea of waiting for the publishing industry to like get it together, to figure it out, 
to, to see us. And we're saying, you know, those of us who are part of the Dignidad Literaria movement, that we want it now. Like, why are we, why is this, just, why is this a thing now? Like we have it, like we don't read. Like our buying power is not like in, incredible. Like why, why is it, why has it taken so long for, for the publishing industry to value us and see us? and include us, you know? Is that a question? That's a question. Uh, I personally think part of it has, most of it has to do with us. We've allowed the publishing industry to devalue, silence, humiliate, and exploit us. It's all in us, really. There are systemic problems. The system's gonna do what the system does. It's up to us to have agency with regard to that. That's kind of, the sensibility that gave birth to Dignidad Literaria. We started exercising some agency. We shook their cage. We stuck, shook the cage of a very powerful corporation. And Miriam looked at Don Weisberg and other people in the eye, and she could and I could see fear of these brown barbarians that were suddenly coming into their, their offices. Like it was kind of unprecedented and beautiful. Miriam's like five feet tall and, and walks in and scaring the shit out of these people was 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 a gorgeous thing to see and i think we need to 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 have that kind of uh that kind of a demeanor about us now as latinx peoples whether we're black brown indigenous a api kind of asian and uh, mixed arab descent uh, latinx peoples we need to kind of get in the face of the industry uh to 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 to, to to, to, to uh, define boundaries that are acceptable and unacceptable like we did with American Dirt. I think, for example, one of the more beautiful things in what we did is white writers are not gonna have to ask themselves, fuck, do I wanna write like she did? I, they're gonna watch themselves and how they write about us now. You know, and that's a good thing. And, and, and we had to exercise our power to do that. Um, and that, and that, that's what excites me about Dignidad Literaria. We, we're just getting started and we, 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 we rattled this big cage. And then COVID-19 hit and we have a break, but we're gonna come back with some news very soon. And then we're gonna come back with a series of proposals, some of which I think will extend beyond big publishing into our own communities. Because again, I think it's a crisis of political imagination that we face and the crisis is ours. If we can, you know, if we can really kind of, uh, uh, go to our deepest dreams and and our highest ambitions for ourselves for that for that two year old and for our children and, and, and look at the crisis we're facing. I, I'm positive our political imaginations will rise to the occasion of themselves and ourselves and drive us to do crazy things where we kind of just go and become those brown barbarians that they fear. I'm going to take. I'm going to move to some of some questions from the um, attendees. Someone wrote, I don't know how to respond to editorial boards who have my stories and acquisitions eventually voting to pass, who give me feedback, including lovely story, important story, but the MC could have made another choice, could have protested and demanded her culture be celebrated at school, she's five, or one POC on our board said she never had that experience. We at Ultra Diverse Book Publishing feel you are telling the story from a white gaze. I'm Argentinian and I'm constantly being pointed towards Mexican American books as examples that have absolutely no relationship whatsoever to the identity belonging stories I'm trying to tell. I'm trying to be who I am, a South American immigrant who tells stories from a point of view I don't see much being published and basically they won't let me see, they won't let, and they won't let me. It's infuriating. I don't know if this is the kind of question you're looking for, but I wanted to share. Yes, it is. And to my, to my folks in publishing. Could you repeat quickly the question part of that? Wait, um, sure. was it, is this an editor talking about the rest of her editorial board when she's trying to acquire? I'm sorry, I think I missed that part. Is it like what happens in an editorial board when you're trying to make yeah. a case for a book you're acquiring and other people aren't getting it? 
I don't know how to respond to editorial boards who have my stories and acquisitions. It's a writer. It's a writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, she submitted a manuscript and, and, and it's being looked at and, and uh, then she gets feedback. A writer can't really speak to, edit to the editorial board, I think. I think that that's, it's a question of like process and, and it's one of those processes that I don't think is like something we need to abolish. I think that people underestimate how much work editors do. I think people underestimate how much editors read and I think people underestimate how much editors are actively looking for work that interests them. And, and I also think that, editor, that a lot of people misunderstand what the work of an editor is. I'm seeking constantly a cer very certain type of work. I mean, it's fiction, it's nonfiction, it's poetry, but it's a very specific thing. I very often pass up great writing that I just know I'm not the editor for. And so I think the idea of like, I just need to get my thing in front of somebody is, is kind of misplaced because there's, there's no real way you can in mass do that. There, there are different strategies you can take to try to get things in front of people. Um, you know, there are institutional problems with the channels available for people. We need more, um, like, quellies, you know what I mean? We need more quelly journals. We need more, um, you know what I mean? We need more Dominican writers conferences. We need more of these avenues. We need fire, fire lit magazine. We need more outlets like that where people can get their writing sort of, for lack of a better word, sort of tested. You know what I mean? Like short fiction mm -hmm. is a sort of way that you can, you're, you're not going to pay 16, everybody's not going to pay $16 for it for a book, you know what I mean? And so journals and, and, and magazines and those avenues need to be those, that, like if that's what we're talking, if we're talking about channels for writers to get to, to, to editors, we need more of those. We need people putting more support behind these, these, these channels for like short fiction. Absolutely, I mean, I, and also this is a great place for editors to start. I, as an editor, most editors I know start in working for literary journals and you cut your teeth reading lots of short stories and you learn how to edit short stories because in some ways they're harder, they're tighter. But again, to like echo Danny, like I think a lot of people think that the job of the editor is just like green lighting a book and then the book it goes and it gets turned into a paper book and it goes off to the stores. And that's really not the case. Um, you, sometimes you're buying a book where it's just a proposal and it's just an idea. And that means you are basically writing the book with this author for two years or something. And that, that is a, a really collaborative experience. So for instance, I might have suffered a particular trauma in my life that makes me understand a book and think it's very urgent and should be in the world and still not want to spend two years thinking about that topic. And I should have the right to like not I have to think about that topic as a human being. And so there's all sorts of decisions that go into doing these and how many sort of books, how far along in the process they are. And somebody I think in the chat was also mentioning um, the role that agents play as gatekeepers. And they play a huge role and it is incredibly important, I think, especially for authors of color to be aware of how agents are positioning their work when they send it to editors. Um, because it's very possible that your, edit, that your agent is positioning it for a white gaze in a way that you might be uncomfortable with. And then it comes across somebody's desk and they have a different read of it. Like I've sometimes read, you know, pitches from agents and then gone and read the manuscript and really was like, oh, these are actually kind of really different. I would have position this differently and maybe you would have picked it up sooner or something like that. So I think that from whether it's getting an agent or how your agent is presenting your stuff and an agent is an extremely big part of the process. Here's another question. How can POC authors advocate for themselves once these major houses in these major houses to make sure their books are marketed in ways that make sense for their intended audiences. So what if any, um, what if any power does a writer have in that, in that sort of conversation in terms of how their books will be marketed, their relationship, do they even have a relationship with the marketing team, the publicity team? That, I would say that that really varies author to author and again, depends on your agent how good your agent is and what they have sort of arranged for you. In the contract process, you can arrange for consultation on things. 
um, and it's something your agent can ask for. I, I love the idea that the, like, um, I think actresses did a few years back of having like a diversity writer. Like, I think that that's something maybe the publishing industry can pick up as an idea, this idea of having some sample language that um, agents can plop into contracts that sort of guarantees either consultation of things that you think might be sensitive and you think like an all white production team or all white marketing team might get wrong. I don't know, That's something like that. I, I think uh, as a, from the author standpoint, you have to go in and advocate and be clear on what you will tolerate and what you won't. Because you are entering a system that is extremely ideological, fraught, and potentially like, you know, gonna mess you up. Uh, I had the good fortune of picking a great agent, Julie Cardin, and uh, she set me up with a, um, a great editor and respectful of my work. But I, I did go in saying, look, we have to understand up front, you will not tropicalize me. Okay, if you look at the way a lot of Latinos, Latinx peoples are promoted, it, it's tropicalized. You're, 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 you're set up with rubber trees, colorful outfits. And like I said, hey man, I grew up in San Francisco's Mission District, down the street from the projects, bro. So that ain't gonna work with me. Um, I mean, one other thing I think you need to be cognizant of as well is what David, Miriam and I called the Appalachian problem in US publishing, right? The industry is centered in New York, but the great majority of Latinx peoples are on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. So we on the West Coast, uh, especially those of us of say of Mexican extraction or Central American extraction, are at a severe disadvantage in the industry because we are not significantly represented in New York City right now. And it's reflected in the publishing industry for all of us. But um, I just, can I, as a New Yorker, can I just put one little thing, say there, uh, uh, the publishing industry doesn't represent New Yorkers either. No, 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 no. it doesn't just represent New Just to be clear, Yorkers, like it doesn't, but, but like most of the people in the I'm publishing saying, are for the Midwest. <laughs> no, right, but if you look at the number of Mexicans in the Latinx community, and you look at the number of Mexicans in the US population, right, it's, Colossally massive, but if you look on the bookshelves, the Mexican population is not represented. We told this to to Macmillan. We proposed to them, for example, to set up an office in Los Angeles, so that they started acquiring books by Mexican descended and other authors. So no, it's not it's not representing what else. But there's a there's a in the case of the Mexican community and Central Americans, it is. I mean, it's not good for Dominicans either. Let's just be straight about that. But in terms of these colossal populations that aren't in New York, they're like massively underrepresented. I think that's a key part, though, of the argument that you're raising that, that's missed in the argument as you raise it, right? You're saying it's not good for Dominicans either, but you're also saying that the West Coast is, is, is more, there's more Latinx representation there. But there's also a wider diversity of Latinx uh, life represented on the East Coast. The problem is a class problem. And we're discussing it like a race problem. There is a race problem. There is a class problem. And they intersect. But what we're talking about right now, in terms of representation, that's a class problem, right? And so if you, if, you, if you look at, like, most of the Latinx literature that's published in this country, it's, it's, it's going to actually skew t towards West Coast uh, 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 lives and, and, and the, the type of Latinos that you find more prominently on the West Coast. Like, that, 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 that's a fact. You know what I mean? And I think that's, that's kind of a part of what a lot of people have bristled about in the rollout of, of quite frankly, of Dignidad Literaria, is that it is because, um, and like, that's natural, right? It, because it's based in the, in, the, in the West Coast, it's gonna take on a problem that, the, that, that, that writers and creators on the West Coast feel primarily, right? But there's a whole swath of black and brown people, who, Caribbean people, uh, Central American people who are not represented by that either, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. Dignidad Literaria becomes representative of, of, of whom? You know what I mean? And, 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 and I think that the, prob the real problem lies not with Dignidad Literaria, but with the methods by which it seeks to make change. By, by speaking to the CEO, we're bypassing an important part of the power that we, really that we really have. You need to go person to person and see what the concerns of the collective body are before you can seek demands. You know what I mean? And so when you go to seek demands, without doing that collective power, without building that collective power first, you're making a non-representative demand of 
you know what I'm saying? Like people on the other side. And, and that's yeah, what we have been experiencing largely. The problem with, is, the problem is Dignidad Literaria is driven by authors who are, who are not like employees of the big five. Of course, but there are authors here on the West, on the East Coast that, that would have liked to have been, and, and I understand like every, the things have to be developed the way that they are, you know what I mean? With the group that you have. But the, I think that, again, like it's, I, what I'm saying is not that the problem is with the Dignidad Literaria, but with its methods. The, met, the top-down approach is the, it's, it's the problem, right? Going directly to a CEO suggests that your demands are more important than the collective body. And there's a collective body you're leaving behind when you go to the CEO. Until you've done some of that collective power building, until you've built coalitions, there should be no conversation with CEOs. And so ultimately, ultimately, the, 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 what CEOs seed is a fraction of what you're going to get every time. Actually, and so if they're seeding a fraction of what a of small sampling is demanding, who's satisfied? Actually, Danny, organizing, in my experience in 30 years, is always organizing a small group to represent a larger group. Any organizing initiative is that. That's a model. Whether you're, whether you're dealing with labor or dealing with, say, liberation theology and community bases in Latin America or say political military organizations, you're always dealing with a small group. And I, we, we've, I mean, we've partnered with a lot of different groups. Uh, Miriam, I think you were gonna say something? No. Again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, to be in conversation with everybody in this room and I'm very happy no, that everybody's I, pressing forward in their way. But like, I think that there is a, a key, key difference in, in organizing models and there's an organizing model that, that, that suggests that we need to have a top-down approach. We need to be making demands of the people at the top. And there's another model that says we need to be building collective power and having the input, the resources, the energy of as many people as possible. And it's not just for the, for the resources, but for the sake of sharpening what you want. I, I would say, I would I say this. For 40 years, we've known that this is a major problem ever since... Walter Dean Myers and Christopher Myers published that piece in the, the early mid eighties. We've known that publishing has a problem. There's been 40 years for publishing to clean its own mess up and for uh, people within publishing to come together and, and, and build these um, revolutionary consensus and so forth. Since nothing substantial has happened, people who are on the outside of those structures who don't live in New York city, who don't know the people that are working in, those publishing houses, but whose communities are affected and have been affected for more than a hundred years by the skewed representation and what it does to young children and, and, and so forth and the perception of the white uh, hegemony in this country of communities of color, we take it upon ourselves to do something. I would, I would submit to you that y'all have had 40 years in publishing and- well, Who's y'all? <laughs> who's y'all? The, the people that you're saying I, that we should be networking with. So, I wanna, oh wait, so wait, what, what, la, what Latinx editors do you know that have had 40 years in publishing? Because give me their number. I, I wanna add them to the, our, our four person group. What I mean is that the publishing industry and the people that work inside of the publishing industry have had 40 years. I think that's I'm ripping you a little bit, David. No, I'm just saying. Can I, wait, 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 I'm sorry, can I just say, that's uh -huh. really kind of a lopsided, the, the, the publishing people over the last 40 years that suggest that that's one body of people. And it also suggests that one body of people, you know, the people in power represent the people who do all the work, right? And so I think that we're in a moment right now, last Monday, like 1500 people didn't show up for work with, with, this, with the same positions. You can speak to anybody that didn't work last Monday. They have the same positions. Right? And that was a representative sampling of this industry, but it was also a, a, a sampling that was built specifically with black and PLC workers in mind primarily. Right? And so when we say for 40 years, this hasn't happened, yeah, you may be right, but it's happening now. And so to ignore that and to ignore that, the reason that that hasn't happened is for, because of outside forces, because of larger systemic issues. And to try to create this sort of boogeyman that is book publishing, it's counterproductive. Book publishing is not a boogeyman. Book publishing is a, a it's, it's, it's capitalism. It's all that it is. We're talking about capitalism. We're talking about market forces. That's what we're talking about. Let's not confuse yes. ourselves and talk about boogeymen. You know what I'm saying? If I can add just one quick piece, I think, I, I think I've only been able to do this work um, because I've been 
thinking about both from Roberto, your angle, Danny, from your angle, like for me, it's all about how do you tackle power structures and how is it that you're able to like, here, here's what we want to get. What are all the ways that we need to strategize to get there um, instead of just finding one particular model that works? I think the other piece that I do want to recognize is that I think it shouldn't just always be on black, brown, people of color to be doing this work. It's not because it, it, then it becomes all the emotional labor that we have to invest in trying to tackle systems that we didn't necessarily build. We were, we're in it, we breathe it, it it's, we're born into it. But it's also like, if, if, if we don't have the collective power and we're not tackling power at the top at the same time from all angles, and I don't necessarily think that we would get anywhere. So I, I disagree with it not being powerful by bringing demand to the CEO. I think it just needs to, both things need to happen. Yeah, I'm not, I'm I not just, like, wait, I, just to clear up my point, because I, I just want to clear up my point and, and the way it was represented. It, I, like, and I fully agree with you, Elisa. But I'm not saying we don't make demands of people at the top. What I'm saying is that before we even think about making demands of the people at the top, before we even try to get into like, like there's a whole labor organizing model, right? I, I think it's like the Saul Alinsky model. And it's, it's one that has killed unions in America, right? It's one that has like changed the shape of, of like, uh, American politics. And it's one that suggests that people need to be getting into boardrooms as quick as possible, right? And I'm not saying that we need to not be making demands of these big companies. What I'm saying is, before we make those demands, we damn well should have spoken to a representative sample of the people that we're saying yeah. we speak for. Just, so if just, you speak for Latinidad, you, like right. Latinidad's already broken. Can we, can we table be... this for a second? Because we have 12 questions and mm -hmm. I want to I honor everyone who's in the space. So let's table this for a moment. Thank you, everyone. Some folks have craft questions, right? And someone's asked, thinking hemispherically, the metrics indicate that black and or indigenous communities are the most marginalized. What steps can be taken to take diversity initiatives beyond simply modifying white Anglo-American hierarchy with the white supremacist hierarchies that, that already exist within our communities? What steps are being taken to, div to, to take, take diversity initiatives beyond modifying the white Anglo-American hierarchy? I think it depends on what you're asking, right? Um, you know, me personally, I'm, I'm working with my, uh, every book I've acquired, in, uh, like, like seven books in the last like two years um, have been black and POC authors. So like that's me and my day-to-day -day job. That's personally what I'm doing in my day-to-day -day job. Um, I can't really speak to like what broader collectives are doing. I don't like, I, I will agree with David and to a certain extent, there hasn't been anybody really doing much of anything for a very long time. And I think if, if you've been in publishing and if you've been published, you're a part of that. And it's, so it's really hard to say that, you know, there's nobody doing anything because the, the minute you enter the thing, you become a gatekeeper, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like, I don't know. I, I want to say that I'm, I'm a part of a broad coalition of, of, of publishing workers that's trying to push, you know, for let's publish less racist books, right? Let's publish more black and, and brown people. Like th those, that's what we're really talking about, right? Let's have an anti-racist industry. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, 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 and I think that there are people doing that work in small ways, but there aren't, there isn't really a, a very large collective. I don't think. And that's the thing I think, you know, uh, not to like bristle when it's you're right that like nothing has changed and then it's also like it's hard to hear because people like Danny and I and you know other people assistant editors acquiring editors you know publicists etc who have been like working their way up through publishing spend a lot of time working on this outside of their jobs they're doing it in-house they're doing it outhouse you know like I our entire board of Latinx and publishing we are all volunteers. It is an incredible amount of work. It is an addition to our work and our, you know, our families and our lives and the books we want to write and various other things. And we're also doing that in-house and it, it is slow work and it doesn't have the impact that we want it to, but that's not for lack of trying. And the amount of conversations that we are having with our fellow editors, with our publicity teams, with our marketing teams, 
whether we're contract workers or in-house, is a constant battle all the time. And it's, you know, I'm similarly to Danny, this is part of my process. I've always um, had mentees, I've always mentored, I've always, you know, tried to publish um, authors of color that existed before this conversation and will exist uh, forever. But um, I don't know, in terms of larger, how do we not replicate the racism within the Latinx community that's on each one of us every day to not to not do that you know I, mean, I think sometimes when i'm talking to white colleagues they think that that the attention to detail and the thoughtfulness and the sort of being aware and doing the anti-racism work only applies to them but it applies to me as well it applies to everybody in our community and we're doing it all the time hopefully um so yeah i don't know if yeah i mean all i can all i can say is all i can speak to is my own experience and um about 10 years ago, when I got my first contract with a small uh, indie press for a, a collection of, of YA short stories, one of the first things that I did was um, realize that, you know, given how long it had taken me and how, how every single um, agent I had ever queried, rejected me and so forth, was that I wanted to create a space for people from La Frontera, where I live down here on the border with Mexico, for writers, you know, for poets and fiction writers and so forth to have a way to get a foot in the door, to get that first publication, to get the, the book they could submit to, to prizes and so forth, because prizes get you recognized, as prizes help um, help you get an agent more quickly, they, they put you on the map. And so I created Flower Song um, Books, now it's Flower Song Press, it's run by Edward Vidaure, the McAllen Poet Laureate now. And we started trying to just create a space, and I know that similar things happen all over the country, um, the, the Dominican writers, you guys do a lot of this kind of stuff as well. Um, and you just reach down, no matter where you are on, on the trajectory of your career, you reach down and you try to pull people up with you. And you try to make sure that in pulling people up with you, you pull up a diverse cross section of the people from your community. Because obviously, um, in the Mexican American community, um, there are light skinned, indigenous, and uh, Afro-Mexicanos and all of those people need to be pulled up and, and you know, we need to have solidarity. And so you do that work and I did that work for a long time and I published with indie presses and university presses um, and kept trying to get agents and was rejected again and again until one of my books won a major award from the American Library Association and then every fucking agent in the world came out of the, word, wo the woodwork looking for me. I mean, it's, it's, es trabajo, es duro. But you can do it. I, I know there are people who are listening to us and been listening to us for a long time wanting to have some practical advice. My practical yeah. advice is write what you believe in, but write what needs to be said also. Write what you know people are hungry for, people like you. Write that, get it published with a small press, and then, you know, as we say in, in Mexican Spanish, le taloneas, you, you get after it. You schlep that stuff around, you work it, you send it to every prize you can you have to be your your biggest advocate you have to believe in yourself and believe that the work that you're doing for yourself and for your community is so valuable que, que estás dispuesto a rajarte el alma to, to get it out there and um and it will pay off i think for the majority of people i've seen it pay off you just you have to keep working at it working at it build your networks um follow authors promote their work you know just get into the mix and eventually you're going to come up against agents and editors and you're going to be you know build a reputation for yourself as somebody who's serious somebody who does the work and who promotes others and lifts others and you will get recognized i got books coming out from harper collins and from penguin random house uh i'm doing really well but i'm 50 you know it took me a long ass time to get here but you can get here you can work the system but you've got to work it in a way that is ethical um, that makes you feel good and that promotes your community the best you can. Uh, because like maybe one day we'll be able to tear this thing down and replace it with something else. But for the, the you know, in the meantime, as Daniela said, I mean, this is what we've got and we've got to make it work the best we can. Right. Um, and I appreciate um, the work that Najeli and, and, and Daniel and, and Anissa and other people in your roles throughout the big five are doing. It's, it's hard. I know lots of, 
you know, Latinx editors who are fighting the good fight from within I, and lots of editors of color. I know how hard it is. I, I, I apologize for seeming dismissive, Daniel. No fue mi intención, nada más fue una reacción. But um, we are all in this together. Oh, I, and we I, should... I, I totally hear you. I, yeah, and, we need, and, and I think we need to pull that. together. And, and your, your critique is, is a valid one. Um, Actually, you know, Dignidad Literaria came into existence in a very organic way about a specific problem, and then it grew from there. But we have networked out, and that we do yeah. have people in different cities all across the country that that are like the dominican work. writers Association. yeah the exactly. dominican writers association yeah, yeah. Well, we I, had like hold on yeah, let but, me well, we I had know. like we we did consultas in like at least 15 16 cities we have presented.org an organization that's critical that i had the privilege of co-founding uh have its 500,000 members kind of know about this and presente uh, is delivering a petition that you can find at presented.org that will ask the state of New York, for example, to investigate the entire industry for discrimination against Latinos, Latinx peoples. So we've, you know, in different ways, online, offline, we've tried to consult. I would just add, the other thing is that as individuals, you know, we have to think in our little individual boxes, which we do in a capitalist system, we, uh, it's good to be conscious of the decolonial work that needs to be done. I came to writing fearing that what would happen to me would be what would happen to, I've seen to other writers, sadly other Latinx writers, that we kind of almost dance minstrelsy for the industry because that's how the industry wants us. We go in, hey, you want me to dance salsa? You want me to be colorful, tropical? Here I go. And I'll do it, right? And fuck that. You know what I mean? You know, we we have to be cognizant that that, that, that that day's done. It's a new day, thanks to Black Lives Matter and others, that we have a new day coming where we're not gonna be dancing sauce and doing minstrelsy anymore. And if you do, you you pay the price. We pay the price for that shit. So, you know, I mean you all know what I'm talking about. People yeah, and it, it's it's funny, but it's in a way it's not because yeah, we do live in a colonized culture and a colonizing culture and we have to like we have the opportunity right now i hear you i so, hear you brother i hear you i i guess i'm i'm just want to you know it, it i i realize that sometimes i start to speak and before i know it it starts to sound like i'm attacking and I'm, i want to apologize for that to everybody um i really appreciate everybody's points here and i definitely really appreciate everybody's hard work in trying to achieve the same aims because i think that we are trying to achieve the same aims but the point that i'm tr really trying to make here is a point about methods not not representation you know, I think that it's really important we move away from the methods we know do not produce the, the, the results we're ultimately trying to see. We know from labor history which methods don't produce the results that the most people, that most workers really want to see. And I think that it's important that we bear in mind labor history in America when we try to build any movement. You know what I'm saying? And so when, when we look at that labor history, we can see that these, the, 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 this approach that suggests that the first step is, is getting a list of demands and going into the CEO's office never works. We, we know that empowering other workers produces the best results. We, we know that empowering workers doesn't necessarily look like, you know, disruptive acts. That, that's why in the chat I just shared, I sh we're doing a, a Juneteenth reading, right? And when I say we, I'm talking about publishing workers. This is not like, we don't have a website. You know what I mean? Like this is just people in the industry deciding to come together and put our hands together on some work that we own and learning how to work with each other, learning how to be workers, building something that we own and taking what we learn in that building and then making demands from that position of power. But that's a long game. That's a long, long game. And so I think that, you know, the, the point that I really want to focus on is a point about methods. What are the methods we're using to try to attain the goals that we all, that I think we all actually share in common. I mean, I'm gonna tag off Danny just on that, just cause I think we need all of the methods. I don't believe in either or, I'm generally like an and person. I think somebody should be scaling the walls, somebody should be digging a tunnel, somebody should be climbing over the gate, somebody else should be picking the lock on the gate. I think somebody should be, you know, reading the Molotov cocktails, I'm sorry. But like, I don't know, I think it like all needs to happen. There needs to be an eight point plan, a 20 point plan, a five point plan, a three year plan, like all of it. Because I don't think we really know what's gonna stick 
but I agree with Danny that anything that's really going to move forward and have lasting power, you know, whether it's organized online or within publishing houses, um, the more conversation we can have between all of our groups, because there's a, you know, there's Dignidad, there's Latinx in publishing, there's Dominican writers, there's all of these groups all over the U.S. doing this amazing work, and some of it is siloed and some of it is not, and I think, you know, if we can bring all of these people together, um, that's, that's how we sort of move forward, and I think it's going to be you know, a long fight with a lot of tools used. We're probably gonna use every tool in the toolkit like five times and sometimes in off-label ways, you know? Like I, I just, I think it's gonna be everything. Um, and then I'm gonna stop talking right now. I'm gonna take um, two more questions so that we can wrap up. Someone's asking a question around um, making their work marketable to these white editors who say, I can't connect with the material. This is an indie animator from South Texas that wants to create fantasy sci -fi, a, fan a fantasy sci-fi graphic novel for Latinx teenage girls. How should they approach? I, I wanna say, don't do that. I wanna say, don't make- I agree. Never strive to make your shit more marketable to white audiences. It, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to break through. It's hard to break through to editors that want to see your work. But the editors that want to see your work want to see your work. They don't want to see the work that you made for a white audience. And so it, I think part of what th that question is, is how do I get to white audiences? But what the real part of the question is, how do I get my work seen? And that, I think, is a, a bigger question that I think uh, people in the, uh, other people on the panel can answer to. There are some good agents that would represent something like that. I really um, suggest you you look at, for example, my, my literary agency, the one I belong to, Full Circle Literary. You can find them online um, and query some of the those agents. Uh, there are there are agents that will represent you, that will guide you, um, that that know the right editors to pitch up something like that to, so that you don't have to kowtow to those things. I I didn't do it for the Smoking Mirror. I, it got passed by 24 different editors. I eventually published it in the press and then it, it's gone on to sell something like 40,000 copies, which for like an indie book is, is, is a pretty good deal. And, you know, they call me Wedo also like 55,000 copies. So sometimes, you know, sometimes what you need is somebody who to be a cheerleader for the work, somebody who understands it. And sometimes you need that to be an agent before it's an editor. So, I'll, I'll, you know, I would definitely look for, uh, an agent who represents that kind of work. Presumably you've read other fantasy written for, uh, you know, like Latinx te teens. If you haven't, you really need to. Um, and then look at the agents that are representing them and hit them up, see if, see if they're interested. And if I can just plug, um, Latinx and Publishing is about to update their agent list on their website. So if you are an agent and on this call, and are interested in acquiring Latinx authors, whether you're a Latinx agent or a non-Latinx agent, let us know and we'll put your info on the site because it is one of the most frequent questions we get at LXP is how do I find an agent? I don't even know where to start. Like who would even consider work like mine, et cetera. And so um, it's very helpful to have these resources where people can just find them. So let us know. I'll take another question. Um, someone's asking about organizations where they could go, resources for, for aspiring writers. I mean, Dominican Writers Association posts resources on their website. I mean, we at, at Latinx and Publishing, we have some resources on our site and you're welcome to email us. We sometimes are able to answer questions. We sometimes are not, depending on what they are. We're not a publisher. We also get a lot of questions about whether we can publish people's books. And unfortunately, Latinx and Publishing is not itself a publisher, but we'll, we'll always try to help you out if we can. I, I wanna say also, I don't wanna be too brusque to hopeful writers, but that's a bad question. The, the internet's a thing, their resources are there. 
There are right. resources. There are resources. And that's not to knock. I mean, I, there are people with circumstances I get, but like, if you're fielding that question here, then you have the, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, this is, that's a, this is a bad form for that question. And I think that that's part of the, the, the overall problem is that people don't really know how to go about, like, you have a room full of publishing professionals and people don't really know how to engage. People don't really know what to ask. People don't really know how much they're demanding sometimes. You know what I mean? And I think that that's a really key thing to bear in mind. Um, who, who, whose time are you using? You know what I'm saying? What are you demanding of those people? Again, we're the, some of the most ex exploited professional class of workers. You know what I'm saying? And so to, de to, to, to sort of make that kind of request a question or de like, I I'm here, I, I tell all my friends who, who do any kind of writing, yo, send me whatever, you know what I mean? I'll read whatever you're working on. And, and th th that's a relationship that I have to my friends who are writers, you know? I, I'm not responding that way to just anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. But there are tons of people in this business, you know? Find those people. I like, you know, it's, it's, it's not hard. So what's um, doing the research is doing the research. Can I add something? Sure. Um, I wanted to say that I think it's really important for folks who are uh, on the prowl for organizations like that to consider creating collectives of their own because it's really important to have in real life community that's local with writers who are facing similar issues and writers who feel like kin and who feel like family. Um, as an example, uh, when I first moved to Long Beach, I had no writing community. I didn't know anybody. And this was back in the days of MySpace. And um, a Chicana here in town um, found me through, through MySpace. And we became like literary friends together and decided that we wanted to make community together. And so we like drafted a dream list of mujeres that we wanted to have in our collective and then invited them over for an initial meeting and the collective morphed over time and it became part workshop, part uh, gossip circle and part support group. And so we were able to give that to each other and we were able to make of the collective what we needed it to be. And I think that, um, I think that's critical. I think it's critical to have those corporeal relationships in addition to um, that digital presence. I mean, that's how Latinx and publishing started, basically. It was like a bunch of people talking to each other in a room about what we were experiencing. And I, I think- That's Scholastic, Mir yeah. <laughs> yeah, like Miriam's point is actually like really important in a number of ways. Like for your well-being as a writer, so you can, you know, manage to stay in the game as long as you have to, because it is, it is very, very hard. But also, I think the only good advice I got from my MFA was on the way out from the director of my pro uh, program who was like, publishing is bullshit, you should start a publishing collective. And I didn't know what he meant at the time and I didn't do it. But I think his point was that similar to Miriam's, like one of the things that I'm, I see as an editor a lot of the time are these groups, these circles of writers that come up in a boats all rise sort of way and they all end up comping each other. And so this is another way to create a system where you're like pinging off each other. So, you know, one of the people in your collective gets a book and they serve as a blurb for, you know, the next person's book. And it's, it's just this way where you start to basically be references for each other to show other people that you exist, you know, and that you have support and that you belong to a community. And it seems like a simple little thing, but it it does make a difference not only to your like mental health as a writer but also to your career so i think that that's a very important point miriam yes i'd love that miriam that's and how the new york that's how the new york city latina writers group launched it was six women meeting we met on meetup i put out a call it was called the goddess writers group and then it turned into the new york city latina writers group and from six women first month turned to 30 women six months, 100 women, and now we're over 800 women in, in the organization who meet, who we, we write in parks, we write online, you know, we, we facilitate workshops. And so it's incredibly important to have that community because we know how isolating, how lonely, how fucking yes. hard writing is. Yes. Our, just one more thing. Oh, called Guayabas. Oh, we were the Guayabas. 
uh, because there was a guava tree in my yard. And so I was like, what the fuck do we call ourselves? And I was looking out the window. I was like, guayabas. That was it. <laughs> I just want to make a point that I think also one of the things, again, to Miriam and Ajeli's point about um, how it's also helpful for your career. One of the things that I know about us as Latinos is, one, we're not taught to network. We don't know how to do, like, it's, we're taught to only speak when you're spoken to. We have all these skills that we don't know how to transfer it in, into how do we build community and how do we then advocate for ourselves. And I think one of, one of those pieces about building community, utilizing the same skills that we use as, and I don't want to, you know, we're also not a monolith, but thinking about what we're, what we're taught as a community and actually leveraging that and turning that upside down to actually work for us instead of against us, like the fact that we know how to have, like, we, if we have large families and we know how to build community or we know how to just, even if it's just in jest or um, being affectionate, like using all those skills that we're taught to be not as important or you, that you have to um, hide to make it in corporate or in these kind of cultures, being able to actually shift that and think about how do you build collective power by actually utilizing the very skills that you're taught not to use in these spaces is actually going to be very helpful whether you're a writer or whether you're just thinking about your career um, it's actually really important yeah awesome. well, i want to make one point last point on this as a sort of a concession to the west coast but also a bit of a lament um i, I want to urge everybody to read ishmael reed's interview and in, in asian american writers workshop recently he he's kicking straight knowledge and this is a person when we talk about like literary institutions keeping people out that is literally a person kept out by literary institutions right and 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 you know he goes into a little bit uh, about of how like there are more um natural sort of communities being built on the west coast i bristle against that because i, I you don't know what you don't know you know what i mean but I, I i would love for more i would love for more to see more of that happen to see more literary real literary community like dominican writers conference coming 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 into fruition here here you know where i'm from i um the last question that is going to be for the educators librarians and small bookstore owners right there's a, a combination what's the question how can marketing practices change to ensure that POC is going to be two, right? How can marketing practices change to ensure that POC books are purchased by institutions like school districts or university courses? And oh, where is it? Did I lose it? I'll type it in. If someone could take that, I'll type it in the chat. Well, hi. I have a book coming out September 1, and I've started mapping. Anytime you do a strategy, you have to map the terrain. So I've started mapping how the book industry works. I didn't know, and I, knew, I didn't realize the, you know, the significant role played, for example, by librarians in libraries, public libraries, university libraries, how big courses, for example, in ethnic studies, American studies, courses that demand, like those are major places where books get sold. And so, and bookstores obviously, independent bookstores in particular, are critical. And so, um, I think there's two ways to, to, to be able to do it. One is political, one is business. The business side is to make the case for why there's an audience for this book. Who are the people that are gonna buy this book, right? Where are they? You have, I've done that. I, I've. I try to show, look, there's a hell of a lot of Centroamericanos who are now on the way to being the, se they're the third and soon to be second largest sub Latino subgroup. Nobody's tapped into it in publishing. There are no big five books by any Central American writers except Hector Tobar, right, in LA. I was just about to say. <laughs> yeah, Hector Tobar, who Danny published, right? And so... <laughs> Yeah, so Danny, you know, Danny, so. I work with um, Hector, yeah, I'm not. Okay, a well, all right, well, we'll take credit back from you, Zendaya. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, Central America, so now I, you know, I started helping educate people in the industry about Central Americanos being a massive population that is utterly underserved. I mean, all of our communities are, but you don't see any Central American books out there. You see them written by white people about us. So that's the business side. The, the, then there's the political side where you just have to kind of go knock on doors, knock down doors like Didier Literaria did and start making the case that makes them listen and say, wow, 
I need to pay attention to this, especially at a time like now. I think their sensitivities are gonna be even higher now because of Black Lives Matter and all that was accomplished. So those are the two. I would say specifically, if you're trying to, to get into libraries, um, take a look at your state's, whatever the, the library association is in your state. Like for me, it's Texas Library Association. Um, I started attending their meetings uh, right after the publication of my first book and started um, attended, attending panels and getting on panels and stuff like that and um, giving out free copies of my book to librarians and so forth. And that's how the the books, The Smoky Mirror eventually ended up in the hands of somebody on the Puerto Bell Bray Committee. Um, networking is super important knowing what organizations represent the audience that you want to reach and then going to those conferences i mean sometimes it's to pay out of, out of pocket when you're starting and just getting in there and like getting your name in front of them getting your work in front of them you just have to take a risk there's not a lot of shortcuts to it frankly so i was going to say that about textbooks and books being adopted in schools that's a, tr a tricky situation because education is decentralized in the United States. So um, book adoption is left up to individual school districts and each school district has its own board of education. So you've got these elected officials, right? And board of, the boards of education tend to be white. And, um, and then the board will um, empower certain committees. So certain teacher committees, textbook adoption committees to screen books, preview books, and then uh, vote whether or not to adopt the book. And the cost of the book influences, cost, book costs influence those choices, but politics uh, in, and racial politics play um, a very big role in what uh, gets chosen and what gets adopted. And when I mention those teacher committees that function as textbook adoption committees, we need to keep in mind that over 80% of teachers in the United States are white. So unless the teaching profession changes and unless public education changes, uh, those adoptions can't occur. And I think I, I told this anecdote the other day that uh, my dad sat on uh, a lot of those committees and he would often be the only Chicano on those committees. And in the 1980s, he was presented with a textbook that was supposed to be used as a, um, a Spanish language te textbook in high schools. And there was an entire page in it about how the donkey was the most common form of transportation in Mexico. And this was in like 1985, you know what I mean? Um, and had my dad not been on that, on that committee, uh, that book would have made its way into schools and, and, and promoted this donkey mythology. So, so it's, it's tricky given the way that I'm, the, the patchwork na nature of public education in, um, in the United States. I think that's all we have time for. I think that there was a wealth of information. One of the things that I've been feeling is that as you all sign off, perhaps you can give some a final thought or something inspiring for those who are emerging because you come into a conversation like this with people who are, are, are doing the work and fighting the good fight. Like, how do we keep writing? Because the truth is we know what's up against us. So if we're having this conversation, we're sitting at this table as people of color, queer people, brown people, black people, having this conversation in fucking circles, like conversations that we know, like, you know, we're doing the best that we can. And so who needs to be in this room, who, who, need, who we need to be holding accountable some are oftentimes not in this space, the people who are the ones who have the power, the people who are the ones that make a change. And so I would love for us to kind of gift the folks in this space something to help them keep writing. Like right now we're in a fucking pandemic and we are in an uprising. And so how do we continue to do this work, you know, and not give up? Well, I don't know that I have a real good answer for that, but I will, I'll, I'll give myself a little, as a little bit of an example. I have not come up the traditional way through corporate big five publishing. I have been working on books for the last 20 years um, in my own way, running my own business, working with indie presses, working with big five publishers, working with literary organizations, and I found a way to do the thing that I love for the most part. It sucks on some days and it's really hard on other days, but 
you know, I'm still writing, even though I know how the sausage is made, I'm still working on my own book and I don't consider myself a huge optimist. Um, but the world like needs our stories and it needs them very badly. And all that this has shown is that they are not out there enough and that we need more of them and we need all of them and we need you all writing all the time because you know whether whether big five publishes them or we build our own publishing houses which i want us to do that publish them and that's another thing like half of the work i've done i've self-financed i've you know produced my own books with co-editors through kickstarters I've found what there are other ways around. I would have loved to walk in the front door and just like walked up the steps and gone into the elevator, but that was not available to me. And I found another way. So there are other ways. Don't give up hope and like, just keep writing. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah. I, I guess I'm, I would add to that, you know, um, there, there, there are people within book publishing that are pushing for, real change and, and, and those changes are not always the things that you see that make it on to social media. Those changes are, you know, hard work being done by people, by workers, you know? And I think that bearing in mind um, that like the dignity of, a, of the workers is the thing that we should all be really trying to, to push forward here. Um, it, it's really easy to sort of like get wrapped up in like you're, you're a writer and, and how do you seek more opportunity and, and, and this and that, but, but, um, I think what, what, what is the community that you're writing to and, and, and how do you want to like, how do you want to honor that community, you know? And, and is it really, you know, by trying to become a bestseller, you know what I mean? Like it, maybe it is, but I think that everybody has to have their own sort of path. And, and I think that like, there was a, there's a very sort of ossified idea of what right, success as a writer looks like. And I think that that needs to sort of be broken. People need to sort of find themselves in, in their writing before they can start to seek success in it. Yeah, like if we want to dismantle the capitalism of the publishing industry, we have to dismantle the capitalism in ourselves and our ideas of success. Like I am never going to be a best-selling writer probably, and I'm never going to be the it girl editor, and I'm going to spend my entire life working on books and hopefully the things I love. And that's, I'm trying to come to a different idea of success. So I agree. Colonize your mind, baby. I would, I would say that for me, there's two things uh, that I would say to, that I do say to uh, students or young writers that I mentor. One is to get rid of the word career from your vocabulary and focus on your vocation because vocation, the etymology of vocation comes from voice, the calling, right? I think we're at a time that requires, we're in this, this intense time of without precedent. We need to, to respond to a call we need to be practical and that's where the career kind of thing, but career connects you to capitalism and, and those structures that are very colonized. So I would encourage people to think about a vocation. Secondly, I think I, uh, I encourage people to uh, really respond with an epic sensibility. We live at a time, not just of a, pan a global pandemic that has us all locked in our homes, like in a sci-fi movie, but climate change is behind and still are all around right now. And you have continued crises of war, poverty and other extreme things that Democrats like Obama or fascists, more openly fascist people like Trump put out. So you have nothing to lose from developing an epic sensibility in your writing and pursue it. I think there'll be an audience for that. And you know, I myself have just, you know, I went through war. I joined a revolutionary organization. I'm Salvadoreño a group not considered by publishing. And so, you know, I said, fuck it, I'm gonna do what I wanna write. And I responded with what, what to my vocation, to my calling, and I responded with what I, I thought was an epic sensibility that took me to mass grave sites, to really scary gang places and other things. And, and, I, and I thought, well, if they don't want it, fine. But they, they did, I did find an audience uh, with an agent and then with an editor, and I think with other people, and I think if you, you know, you stick with the dream. Sometimes they will pay you to, 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 to dream and, and, but you have to do it on your terms and do it like you're fucking crazy. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's true that you have to do it on your own terms, but I would submit to everyone that as long as the capitalist structure exists, as long as hundreds of millions of dollars are being made 
by the 90% of authors being published every year who are white, for us to abdicate, abdicate rather, our, um, our piece of that pie, for us to say, I am going to go off on a path that doesn't, you know, provide me the same kind of monetary rewards, doesn't open those rewards up for other people in my community. Um, I'm going to do it because it's, you know, just my vocation and because it's from the heart. Those are all like wonderful things. But then what they do is they just say, okay, we're just going to move ourselves away and let those people continue to make hundreds of millions of dollars because our communities are buying their books and our, our, the, our schools are making our children read those books they're on the summer reading list they're in the libraries and so forth like i don't think that we can collectively take that i mean individually we can but collectively we have to fight for the money for our piece of that pie for it to be equitably distributed until such a time as the money is taken completely out of the equation and that's not going to happen anytime soon and so in the interim we need to be fighting so that we have latinx authors on the bestseller list so that rather than giving Janine Cummins, you know, a million plus uh, for the book that, that we have, you know, um, 50 Latinas getting $20,000 advances or whatever. Like we need to make that, those fights are important and we cannot exclude money from the equation. So what I would say is write what's important, write from your heart, stick with it and don't give up. But as you get to the place where you can begin to demand money, demand the money, get paid, <laughs> get paid, and then use that money to support other people, um, to fight the good fight. You know, I spent nearly $4,000 flying to New York City to fight for the United idea. You, you invest the money in the fights that matter. As you're making the money, you use it for good. That's all, that's all I can say. You just don't be yeah. like them. Don't be like them, but get paid because they're getting paid. And the, it, the, we can't just let them be the only ones getting paid. Can I say something real quick? Of course. Okay. I, and and this, is, uh, this relates to publishing and writing, but it's also um, uh, just a broader political statement. Just because of the conditions under which we're living, which are fascist conditions, uh, so many of us are distracted by the present and the present comes to feel eternal, right? It's hard to contemplate the past and it's even harder to contemplate the future. But I think that if we're going to survive fascism, we need to sort of disengage ourselves from our continuous sort of preoccupation with the present moment and start radically reimagining a hopeful future, as people were mentioning earlier, right? And I think that that was part of uh, Trump's appeal is that he offered a vision of the future to white supremacists in which they could see themselves, uh, uh, they could see who they were sort of um, re, re solidify. They, they, they understood what, what they were being offered. Um, and Democrats haven't been able to counter with any sort of hopeful vision, right? There's not necessarily like this concrete vision of the future that's being promoted. And so I, I would like to invite people to, to, to be forward thinking in that sense and, and, and reignite um, those sort of, their radical imagination. Thank you. My thoughts are maybe less concrete, maybe a little bit softer, but the two things that come to mind about, at least at your point, how do you keep going is, um, one, just waking up um, in your body is an act of resistance, um, and being able to, to be grounded in that is, has been really important um, for me. Two, I think the way that I've been able to navigate the world um, is by learning from a very young age, learning what are all the rules, being so, so clear about all the rules that exist, and then knowing them so deeply that I can figure out what are the ways that I can be strategic about breaking them um, in whatever system that, that you're in. So I think for those, um, for, for those who are on the line and are, and are thinking about this and are tired and are figuring out how to keep going, it's how do you, I think it's about really, sticking true to that and this isn't something that people haven't already said but sticking sticking true to the voice and believing that you matter in the world and that what you say matters um, and that that even if it's only a seed of understanding or a seed of a belief that that is 
incredibly powerful and incredibly important, and to Miriam's point, an incredible part of the vision for the future. Um, if, if nothing else, if you can hold on to that, I feel like it, it kind of gets you through to, the, to sometimes the lowest points. And I want to add to, to the writers who are struggling right now because of everything that's happening politically um, in our communities, all of the death, all of the grief, all of the loss that we're experiencing collectively in this country, um, that I invite everyone to really remember why it is that we picked up the pen to fucking begin with. There's a, there's a reason why we answered that call. You know, yes, we're, we're looking at these seven figure book deals and I'm like, what the fuck? How are you even writing this story? You're not even Mexican. Like, what is this about? Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that we, we do have something really important to say and our experiences matter. And, you know, to everyone's point here, like we should be doing our research. We should know what we're fighting for. But when it, but when we sit down at that desk and we're looking at that blank screen and it's just us and those and and that world we're trying to build, I think we need to put some of this shit to the side to get quiet because we know that the work requires a lot. A lot. It's not easy to to do this work. Those of us who are writers, none of us are really doing this shit for like the fame. Like it's that it, like it's not even about that. But those of us who are on this call, we feel very, very passionate about. Um, ensuring that there's visibility for all of us, for our people, for black and brown people. And so with that, I want you to keep writing. I just want you to keep writing, write the fucking story, write, write the story that you were born to tell um, because our ancestors fucking fought so that we could be, be here doing this. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of the panelists. Thank you, Anissa Polanco. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you, David. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Nacheli. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, for, for being here. There were moments it got hot, but that's what it is. Where we th then that's that's our that's our history. That's our we move in that way anyway. So I, I still feel love in this space. And thank you, Word Up Community Bookshop, for allowing us this forum. Thank you, Dominican writers, Angie Abreu. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you, everyone who is here tonight. It was two hours. I know some of us are starving. I know I haven't had dinner, and I've been going since 5 a.m. So anyway, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for being here. And um, pa'lante. Pa'lante. Thank you all. This has been great. Uh, looking forward to having more conversations with all of y'all, um, which I know we will. Um, peace. Peace. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao.